complaining. So I will actually give the dismissal, but we will remain in our seats, remain in place for the prelude. And then at that point, as it concludes, we are free to go. Now, before we begin, I'm going to pause and see what sort of questions, because I'm sure I've overlooked something. And there are no silly questions, except the ones I asked. Seeing no questions, then I will invite us to take just a moment of silence as we prepare to begin our service. Please stand as you are able. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Let us confess our sins against God and our name. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, bring us into eternal life. Lord, open our lips. saying together the jubilee. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O oh Lord, know it all together. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. If I climb up to heaven, you are there. If I make the grave my bed, you are there also. Even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand hold me fast. Darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light to you are both alike. Look 
well whether there be any wickedness in me and lead me in the way that is everlasting. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The first lesson is from Genesis. Chapter 28, verses 10 to 19. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And ye shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel, the word of the Lord. Please stand as you are able. And join me in reading together the song of creation. Glorify the Lord, all your works of the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. In the firmament of our glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. The second lesson is from Romans, chapter 8, verses 12 to 25. Brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, in the flesh you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption when we cry, Abba, Father, 
It is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If in fact we suffer with him, so that we also may be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy compared with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from his bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The word of the Lord. Please join me in reading together the New Testament canticle, You Are God. You are God, we praise you. You are the Lord, we acclaim you. You are the eternal Father, all age and worship you. You are all angels, all the powers of heaven. Fear of them and serve them, sing them in the spirits. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your will. The Lord is making the apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of prophets praise you. The white robe and the iron praise you. Thou for all the holy church of the kings, Father, majesty, and thunder, your true and only Son, worthy of all of us, and all of the fear and the death and the power. You, Christ, reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus put before the crowd another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them that both of them grow together until the harvest. At the harvest time, I will tell the reapers to let the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned to gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. The disciples approached him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, 
The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds of the children are the weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evil doers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. The word of the Lord. speak to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're greeted this morning with very familiar, excuse me, very familiar stories, ones we've heard many times before. Uh, but I am going to go out on a limb and bet you might be getting a slightly different take or interpretation on these this morning. Um, so, not to change the subject, but I'm going to tell you that the point I want to preach upon is actually not overtly in these lessons, but it is a quote that's attributed to Bishop Irenaeus of Lyon, a second century bishop, one of the early doctors of uh, theology. And Bishop Irenaeus is known to have said, the glory of God is the human person fully allowed. Beautiful sentiment, but just what the heck does it mean? And, you know, is there some sort of uh, insight to how to get from point A to point B? Well, I think this is where our readings today come in handy for us and are helpful. And they began with the psalm with the acknowledgement that whether we are conscious of it or not, God is involved in each and every one of our lives. And the beginning of it may be just that awakening to that fact. That comes to different people in different ways. In the psalm, we have this acknowledgement. Let me get my glasses again. Where am I focus? Um, so in the psalm, we have, it begins, Lord, you have searched me out and known me. Know me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. For the psalmist, it is a beginning that is rooted in just simply an awareness, an acknowledgement of God in our, involved in our lives. But then he offers a sentiment that many of us, I suspect, probably have experienced before, where can I go then from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? I can only speak for myself, but I suspect there are others who've had that sentiment before, that there's just no getting away from the hounds of heaven sometimes. But then the psalmist turns it again to not just an exclamation or a lament to where I can get away, but then to an invitation, inviting God in. Search me out, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my restless thoughts. There is that beginning of surrender, which is perhaps one way to begin a journey into relationship with God, into becoming one who is fully alive. But we get other hints as well. In our Old Testament reading, our lesson from Gen Genesis, we know the familiar story of, of Jacob's ladder is what many of us know it as. Jacob sleeping in the wilderness, his head on a rock. I don't know why he does that, but I guess he needed the support. But the vision, and then realizing, surely God is in this place. For some of us, it comes by accident. This awareness of God. It's not something that we necessarily seek or are searching for in the first place. 
but we find it thrown, thrust upon us, and often at some juncture, critical juncture in our lives. And that, I think, is kind of what Jacob is experiencing. If you remember the context, Jacob has just left his mother and his father and his brother. He is beginning a journey to his north, to his ancestral home, in search of a wife. He doesn't know what's waiting for him. And he's combining two of the great stressors in life that uh, we all have encountered, or many of us have encountered at some point. That is a move, a relocation from a familiar place to a strange place, and a marriage. These are natural stress points in our lives. And so perhaps it was in his state of sort of uncertainty or insecurity about what he was up to that brought him to this realization or awakened his consciousness to recognize that God is surely in that place. So Jacob, this will happen again to Jacob. There's also the famous story of Jacob wrestling with God. It happens 10 chapters later. And again, it's one of these where Jacob's facing a huge stressor. He's about to be, he's trying to, uh, hoping to be reconciled to his brother Esau. And the night before, he's sleeping in the wilderness and has, again, a very vivid physical dream. Again, God asserts God's self in his life amidst his anxiety and fear. But perhaps we have never had that experience. For those of us of a more contemporary society and a more contemporary church, our experience perhaps has been more conventional. Infant baptism, baptized as a young child, uh, a decision made by our parents and thrust upon us by uh, some zealous clergy person. And we just take it for what it is. And we don't necessarily though, recognize or realize that that is, a, until perhaps later in life, that that is a very close encounter with God. That is our first the planting of the seed of the Holy Spirit and dwelling within us. And as Paul alludes to in his letter to the Romans, I love the reference to, and I'm paraphrasing here, the whole world is groaning in anticipation this idea that we are, the Holy Spirit has been planted within us and we are now in the midst of labor, trying to give birth to this creature within ourselves, our awakening and claiming the God in our presence and in our bodies. So then, where does that leave us when we come to the gospel? Well, the gospel, I think, is, I think we make too much of it in the sense that we try to get to too fancy, too sophisticated. I think it's quite frankly is a very straightforward analogy, metaphor. That those who have encountered God, with whom God dwells, that seed has been implanted, and God is there. That is the wheat. And hopefully some of it's going to grow and be fruitful and yield 100 fold, 60 fold, and even 30 fold. But there is also right next to it the weeds. Those things that aggravate us, those things that torment us, that just drive us crazy, that we would just love to eradicate and remove. And this is where I think the fullness of being fully alive is the glory of God, it is the recognition that we are not called to, to be the judges, to, to be the gardeners with the hose, to weed out the weeds, but to leave them in place. Let them grow alongside. Or trying to take out the weeds and becoming preoccupied with the weeds, we may, in fact, be doing our own selves harm, spiritual harm. But rather, to let the weeds go and to lean into that indwelling spirit and that gift of God's presence that will help us abide, will help us to be open, to hear the opinions and ideas and thoughts of others, even those we may not agree with but to let them be and to recognize that all God is seeking for us is for us to grow, to grow in kindness, to grow in compassion, to grow in love, just as his son Jesus Christ demonstrated for us, that we may be fully alive. Simply put, to be fully alive is to be whole. Anything else the weeds in the world that may attract us and draw our attention. Those things are the profane things of this life and of this world. 
be drawn to that which is holy. Be open to the profane, but recognize it for what it is if you're rooted in the holy. And then you will fully realize the glory of God. Please join me in saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the Holy Son of the Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered in the Pontius Pilate and was crucified and died in the grave. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again as of the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. ministers with righteousness. And your people's sin is God. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. All in you and in your safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care.
prayers of the people, for the sick, who lift to God, all who have asked for our prayers, especially Isabel, Carolyn, Kay, Al, Bob, Dick, Elmer, Letty, Carol, Dennis, Gail, Jackie, John, Marilyn, Lindsay, William, Peter, Huffin, Leland, Dee Dee, Dixie, Evelyn, Lee, Jean, Karen, Lexi, Sandra, Nancy, and Irene. For those in harm's way, we lift to God those in harm's way, especially Michael, Ian, John, Scott, Russell, and all essential workers. In thanksgiving, we thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of his life. For those who have died, we pray for all who have died, especially Sherman Hall and Third and Ethel and Nikki, those who are dying and those who mourn. Son to preach peace to all those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold, pour out your spirit upon all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Standing as we are able, please join me in the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercy, that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to Him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Please be seated to enjoy the postman. Mm -hmm. 